All right. So welcome to Coastal, you guys. So today we're just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the ideas and try to wet your whistle. So don't worry about writing notes today or whatever. This is really more about starting to spark our ideas and, and the concepts that we're um, going to be touching on throughout the semester. So um, this is, uh, I mean, I make up different titles every year, but um, uh, this one, uh, Cimarron or Keras, uh, I think is a good way to think about, uh, one way to think about coastal management. So the first were these Greek mythical people that lived in sort of shadow and darkness near the land of the dead and things were always vague and things were always ominous and things were, were scary and we couldn't see the path forward. The other uh, there is uh, the um, a, a child of Zeus and is the personification of opportunity and cool things and, and chance and what if this thing turns out the right way? And that really is coastal management. So coastal management is, is resource management broadly writ. It's where almost all the crazy stuff happens. It's where the biggest challenges are on our planet. It's where the greatest transformation with the possible exception of fresh water streams. It's where the greatest transformation to our planet um, has happened thanks to our choices and our actions. Um, it's where um, our culture comes from as a planet, It's where, by and large. It's where our industry comes from, all that kind of stuff. Everything's wrapped up in this relatively narrow spot of our places on our planet called the coastal zone. So we're going to be talking about that this semester. So to begin, I wanted to talk about some representative challenges. And today and forever, you guys can always interrupt me. So if something doesn't make sense, say, whoa, 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 what was that? Or, or you raise your hand or just you will not um, offend me. And, and uh, so please do that. If something um, is not clear or something doesn't make sense or something is an error, because um, God knows I never make errors. Right? Um, so this is, uh, this is as of a couple hours ago. Uh, let me turn the lights. Let me do so. Okay, so what we're looking at are wind fields right now, and um, the storm on the left is a tropical storm as of right now. It will become a hurricane in the next few hours. Uh, Franklin is a hurricane off on the east coast, um, and there are two more behind this, behind these guys coming on into the eastern seaboard. Um, this is the reality of our time dealing with these types of storms and, and challenges. Um, so this is the path of what will soon be hur the hurricane that's going to strike Florida um, in the next several hours. Um, uh, this is coastal management. Dealing with disasters and dealing with um, uh, very tragic happenings is part of coastal management. Um, and it happens every, so this is right now, this is this year, right? Um, every year when we start this class, this stuff pops up, right? So 2020 was Marco and Laura, uh, uh, Hur Hurricane Harvey, Swamped, uh, and all these things. When, when all these things happen, what you hear is, oh my God, unprecedented. Oh my God, we never knew it could have been, fill in the blank, all BS, almost all complete crap. We do understand that, that these things are risks, and we do understand that the choices we've made in terms of various aspects of coastal management have set us up for, for things unfolding the way they're going to unfold. And in, in this one example here, as this hurricane parked over Houston, it dumped more rain than we've ever seen a hurricane dump before in, in that short, it was a very, very slow moving hurricane, just essentially parked over the city of Houston, the fourth largest city in the US and just dumped and it's very, very flat. And because of our choices in terms of how we manage waterways and things of that nature, massive numbers of places flooded. Since then, you would have thought, oh my gosh, now we know that these, I mean, if we didn't know before, now we know that these um, you know, home tracks and these regions of the city are vulnerable to flooding. Nope. So the most common thing now is, uh, is to remove houses from the potential flood zone um, by essentially some uh, political machinations so that people can put more houses in areas that are subject to flood, which sounds kind of crazy, but that's how we seem to roll. 18 years ago today um, was 
uh, Hurricane Katrina. It made landfall. It made landfall just sa- in the southern part of uh, Louisiana, um, and then went went the boot tip of Louisiana, and then went up and hit uh, New Orleans. And I was teaching this class, and this was the first that happened to be the first day of this class, um, uh, just when, we, when I had just moved down from my previous university and we're starting, and we threw out all of the all of our lesson plans, and we just talked about this for about two weeks straight. Um, we had students come leave New Orleans, come to Channel Islands to, to spend the semester because their schools, uh, Tulane and, and University of New Orleans and all these other places were, were literally nuked. Um, and that sparked our university and our program, in particular ESRM's, deep commitment to dealing with disasters, particularly in the coastal zone. So. Um, our students did a huge, huge bunch of fundraisers. It sounds like the same thing is starting to spin up now for our friends in Lahaina, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and, uh, and over here on, this, on the North Quad, there was nothing. So there, there was little, none of these buildings were renovated or anything like that. And we had um, uh, carnivals in there. The students had bake sales. We raised all this money. And then our students said, uh, and then uh, you know, they said, How, what do we do, what do we do? So the first thing we need to do is send money, right? That's what these response organizations really need is cash. Um, not diapers or water bottles, but the ability for them to adapt as to what they need on, on the fly. So we did that, and then our students said, in December, they said, hey, that's great, so now you should take us to New Orleans. I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's all messed up, but you should take us because you know about wetlands and you can, you can help. And so, so starting, um, uh, about six months after the storm, we did, I did our first, uh, first reconnoitering, and then the next year we brought our first class, and we've been going every year since, except for the two years of the pandemic when nobody could travel anywhere. And so we've been working on rebuilding um, the human um, parts of this part of our planet and the natural parts, the wetlands. Um, what you see here is this is the city of New Orleans, if you guys don't have a, a sense, this is the famous... Um, uh, you know, Crescent of the Crescent City fame. Um, and what you're looking at here are all the color. Uh, the color is all the depth of water. So the natural, the, the storm came through, whacked the city, whacked people outside the city. But the thing that was unique about this, or the thing that really makes this a particularly important coastal management story, is the fact that we had levied the, this town. So we'd protected this area with a series of levees. Um, in the 60s, a, a, another hurricane had come through and flooded some of these low-lying areas, and the President of the United States came to the New Orleans and said, never again, and committed the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, um, uh, the, the federal arm of the government that deals with dams and flooding and things like that, and said, we'll never allow this hap- to happen again. Spend billions of dollars, spend decades of your money to protect this city, that completely and utterly and totally and catastrophically failed. So over a thousand people died in the city because we did not know how to do stuff. And what I mean by not know how to do stuff, they failed GIS. So when people put the levees in, they used the wrong datum. So it was not as high as they thought. When people built the, the quality of the, of the levees, they were, they were stuffing newspaper and sand into areas that should have been concrete and mud. Um, when, and it goes on and on and on and on. So we always look for a, a victim and who the bad guy is when these disasters happen, but more often than not, it's a series of poor management decisions that aren't any one person's responsibility, but collectively amount to very sketch situations and very dangerous situations. So that's what happened. The, the town is still flooding. So the vast majority of the town floods and is underwater for an extended period of time. And this overlaps the, the parts of town that are the most inundated, the most destroyed, the most um, impacted are the areas where folks are the most marginalized, right? So the, the highest African American, the communities that have the highest proportion of African Americans, lowest income, all the things we typically think of as disen- disenfranchisement. That's what happened in Katrina. So, so, um, this really is a blueprint for our future in terms of if we don't do it right, we're going to see more and more and more of this type of uh, Katrina 18 years ago today. Um, and it's not just Katrina, right? This is us, too. Good time, Ted. 
And it's a good illustration of what the fire did uh, last night and into this morning, December 7th. Zone, right, really on this strip of land. So right here, um, the, they've held it at the train tracks. Trains have been halted right now. But you can really see uh, how... Okay, and, uh, and so not only is, is coastal management about, you know, direct damage, but also all of these other aspects like uh, environmental health and how do we have a healthy community. Normally we think of the coast as being this really healthy place to live and cool air and all that kind of stuff, but increasingly it's a, it's a focus of poor air quality during these wildfire events and things of that nature. Um, okay, let's talk about Lahaina. So this is Lahaina uh, just before the pandemic shut down. So during the, uh, during the pandemic, I was on sabbatical and uh, I was in um, with our, our uh, colleague who runs the uh, nonprofit in Lahaina that w we've been monitoring uh, humpback whales, mother calf uh, associations for several decades, originally from boats, now with, from boats with drones. Um, and so we were there helping uh, do, you know, fly some drones and, and stuff. Um, this is the shot from the water back over through, so behind us in front of us, and then what you see on the background is solar panels. Awesome, sounds great. We're, we're, we're trying to be more sustainable and more um, uh, robust and resilient in terms of our uh, coastal energy generation, awesome. But the, everything around that though, what you see all these, this, this hillside, that's all farmland. And much of that is stuff that uh, the area behind Lahaina is stuff that used to be pineapple or sugar plantations. The, those operations, so there's a whole history of that with, with um, typical, typical colonial sort of going in and taking over land and all that kind of jazz. Um, but setting that aside, more recently, one of the consequences of that is finally it became not particularly financially worthwhile to keep growing uh, sugarcane and things of that nature in Hawaii um, because of labor costs and stuff like that. Starting in the 90s, 90s to the early 2000s to 2010s, that industry shuts down. In its wake, now we have all this landscape that used to be in all kinds of crazy uh, biodiverse and, and sustainable production stops. So what do we have? A massive amount of invasive grass, mostly grasses, but invasive plants come in. So right now, one fourth, 25% of the land mass of Hawaii is dom of the whole state is dominated by invasive species. Another key coastal management challenge. And so those grasses, that that fuel was one of the key things that fueled the Lahaina fires. So we see the, the consequence of you know, colonialism and all these other things still making problems for us in terms of uh, coastal management um, uh, today. And, and I should say, this used to be, one of the reasons that we even located a lot of agriculture here on the west side of Maui was because of the tremendous amount of water, so much water. So there were breadfruit fields here, there were taro fields, there were wetlands, there were, it was just a massively wet happening place. And that's why the, the commercial agriculture went in there because there was so much water. Now that water has been diverted to other things as opposed to the natural landscape. Um, so uh, this is what, this, it, you know, kind of a representative picture of what it looked like when it was in hardcore sugarcane production. And this is the things shutting down, as I was mentioning. This is one, one uh, ref um, um, uh, sugar refining facility. And then this was uh, two weeks ago, right? So this is uh, downtown uh, Lahaina on fire. Um, this is the harbor of Lahaina that our, the boat that we use burnt up and most of the boats burnt up, right? It happened so fast, folks were actually jumping in the water um, to escape the flames. Um, and this is the, the waterfront of Lahaina as of, to, as of now, right? So the businesses are nuked. People's homes are destroyed. Um, the, the coastal infrastructure is harmed, um, and on and on and on. A series of poor management decisions. So the, the rhetoric right now in, in, the, um, in the media is, oh, the silly firefighters have pulled out. Oh, the, chief, the, the head of the fire department that was on vacation. And, the, and those are all things, and, and the lack of 
notification, right? We have a fantastic emergency warning system here and in, in across Hawaii, but especially in places like Lahaina, uh, optimized for tsunamis and hurricanes that happen you know, more frequently, but it could have easily been activated for other disasters, it was not. The conversation, so it's important to have those conversations, but don't be distracted. We always want to find the boogeyman, the bad, the a-hole that didn't make the right decisions, right? And those people should be held accountable, and, and those are important conversations to have. But much more fundamentally is the system that allows it to be the case that one silly person's decision can lead to all this badness, right? So we want resilient coastal systems, natural systems, human systems. Um, and then this is just a quick, we'll just play a little quick thing that goes in a little more detail um, what I was talking about. All these things we're talking about are, are in the news all the time, right? And, and these, are, these are what are driving a lot of our conversations nationally, et cetera. Um, now the conversation turns to, uh, hey, should people uh, come to Lahaina? Another example of the value, just staying with Hawaii one more time before we come back to um, other parts of the world. Uh, this is an example of some of the culture that we have in our coastal zone, how rich it can be, particularly with, with, uh, traditional, uh, with traditional practices. So I'm at a market here, a night market on, uh, where was this? This was um, this is the big island of Hawaii, I think. Um, and this guy ain't working either. What happened? All oh, my massive high tech. Hi. Who you say who you are and where we are. Okay, uh, hi, I'm Betsy. Um, we're at Calaprada, Uncle Robert's Alpha Bar. This is my jury table, and I'm about to tell you about myself. So tremendous uh, traditional ecological knowledge, right? Huge amount of, uh, of understanding of these systems when people lived, especially when people lived intimately with them and depended on them for food and other resources, right? Um, uh, all kinds of wonderful uh, insights, uh, et cetera, can be gleaned um, from those things. We also have a lot of recreation op recreational opportunities and have fun at the coast, right? This isn't all just doom and gloom and, oh my God, the world's ending, oh, you did this bad, right? It's awesome to be at the coast. There's all kinds of neat things. So this is from last week uh, in, in urban, uh, in the middle of urban Brisbane, which is the third largest uh, metropolitan area in Australia. This is one example of uh, one way you can manage your coastal resources. So we're in Brisbane, in Australia. And this is uh, on the Brisbane River. So this is just uh, a few, um, a little bit less than a kilometer from the ocean itself. And uh, the water here is flowing this way down into the ocean. And so what these folks have done is a, it's a waterfront redevelopment. So something that we're working on doing in, in Los Angeles, that people have done in uh, San Antonio and other places, river walks and stuff. But in this case, they've created a much more immersive experience of the coast. And so here, if we look around, there's all these pools. So they, this is all for people to engage in. This, so this is, is a swimming, swimming pool. pool. This isn't like looking at pools. It's people to go like yeah. do exercises there's in and everything. Mountains. There's there's over here there's a, uh, artificial beach. So we're a little bit inland for sediment to be properly um, uh, deposited like a traditional uh, There's a big artificial beach in the middle of town. Right. But essentially they pulled the coast farther inland here. And so this is swimming, this is, you can't dive, but this is swimming and kids playing here, you know, bathing, people can hang out on the beach. There's uh, all kinds of chase lounges here that the public can flop in. This is all free. So this is just, you can walk on up and hang out for the day or hang out for the evening um, or what have you. So this is um, an interesting way to bring the, the coast and the, and the immediate shoreline, coastline, farther inland as an amenity and attraction. And then around here, which you can't see very well, but there's massive skyscrapers going up. There's a whole bunch of development that's being spurred by all the people that come here, as well as all kinds of um, uh, restaurants and eat nighttime entertainment venues and all that kind of good stuff. This is Street Beach in Brisbane, one example of what you might uh, want to do in terms of coastal management when you're trying to induce tourism and induce people to have a, a tighter sense of 
public post in an entertainment and recreational context. Okay. Uh, there's other kind of things. So one of our first labs we'll do is on um, on uh, elasmobranch e ecotourism. And so in this case, this is another example from Hawaii. This is an example from the Big Island, um, where we put out these big giant lights. It pulls in plankton, and the manta rays come in to feed on the plankton, and um, people can scuba dive and snorkel around it, um, becoming a huge challenge because it's become so popular. There's so many so, you know, um, dive operators on top of dive operators on top of dive operators. And so this is the scene just about um, from uh, the share, this one big uh, hotel there on the Kona side. If I took a rock and was at the, at the beach and threw a rock, I would probably hit these guys. They're very, very close into shore. Um, and so uh, a relatively sustainable um, ecotourism uh, types of thing, which we'll talk about when we get to that. But um, nevertheless, a lot of still management challenges because it becomes so popular. How do we make sure people are safe and aren't, aren't you know, plopping anchors on top of everybody else's heads and stuff? And then, of course, we eat a lot of this stuff ourselves, a lot of these resources. This is off of Malibu. And we see here, looking just off the coast of Malibu, we're just about... At your, the bottom of your Road here on the edge of Each of those white lights is a big, massive uh, squid boat. Okay. So, um, so all these things are, are, relative, are relevant to what we're going to be talking about in our class. Um, I'd say another key aspect of the coast is the diversity. Right? So there's a diversity of physical things, there's a diversity of biological things, there's a diversity of cultural things. Um, and these are just a few examples of things you see, you'll see sitting around in my office um, as examples of some of that diversity. Um, we also, so this is coastal and marine management. So we're talking about the coastal zone and we'll talk about the definitions of what we mean by the coast next week, uh, the, the official definitions. But for now, and for, in most cases, what we mean is, we mean the area next to the sea that's strongly influenced by the sea and the area of the sea that's strongly influenced by the land. And then we can get into all the legal different definitions, but that, that's the conceptual thing. We also will talk about open ocean stuff in this class, marine, more fully marine stuff. Um, and uh, because of that, but the nature, especially for over the, the history of our species, because it's been so difficult to get out into the ocean and do stuff in the ocean, much of the uh, many of the traditions and the, and the decisions of, and that kind of stuff relate to the fact that um, we could not control the sea. And it was this sort of lawless, this area beyond the law, et cetera. So another quick video here, and then maybe we'll take a quick, uh, quick break in a second. This is... This is Prohibition era. So this idea of being beyond the law, right? At the time, US territory only extended out to three nautical miles, because that was a distance you could fire a cannon and we could drive out ships. So it was what you could physically protect from the, from the land, and that was everywhere. So these ships were literally just three point whatever mile, nautical miles offshore, and were doing whatever they wanted, and it was, it was beyond the, the reach of, of the US uh, federal or state law or anything like that. The same thing goes on all the time. The biggest, the, the clearest example of this right now is in the South China Sea today with China trying to take over all of this, all of this chunk of international waters. And it's doing that by going to coral reefs, coral atolls, pumping sand, smothering, destroying the coral and the biodiversity and everything and killing everything filmed up uh, have, having fake fishermen out there that aren't really fishermen, they're really just projections of power. And then once they've sedimented in these, these islands, building military bases on these islands and then claiming this is our territory. Um, there's in the news every, day, uh, every week um, now, um, confrontations between the Philippines and China, all this stuff has to do with what's lawless, who controls the high seas, how do we know how, many, how much tuna are being captured out in the wild because you know, nobody's there. These are real challenges for coastal marine management. So ghost fishing, things like of that nature, dwell in this land of beyond the reach of law. 
Um, and then we can talk about uh, uh, things that, and a lot of stuff we'll talk about might seem very depressing, right? So this is the Great Barrier Reef, and we've had a series of coral bleaching events. We've all heard about the craziness of Florida, or maybe, hopefully you guys have heard about the craziness of Florida the last few weeks, where the water five feet down in some of the keys is, is, is hot or hotter than a hot tub, right? So the fish are just, can't handle it. The coral are just dying. Um, and so coral bleaching is a real phenomenon, and that's gone on several times on the Great Barrier Reef. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest biogenic structure on Earth. It's the thing you can, the, the clearest sign that life exists when you're looking at the Earth from space. So the Great Barrier Reef is this massive thousands of kilometers, thousands of small islands, and all this kind of great stuff. And the story has been, you know, and for most coral reefs, they're hurting. They really are hurting. They're disappearing. They're going away. Um, and we need to change our practices if we want to save them. Having said that, this is last week. This is me last week at, at, one, at one reef. Um, and uh, it's not all dead. It's not all gone, right? It's hurting. We should see more. So that this coral balmy that I'm on, we should see more things that are like a, like a um, deer antler kind of thing sticking up. That, those types of coral, those have pretty much disappeared from a lot of these areas in the wake of these coral bleaching events. But these more massive corals, like the ones that are in front of me, these are still around. And um, it's not as if we have 0% coral cover or anything like that. So it's not as if things are done and gone and everything's over. No, we can still turn this stuff around. But there are changes that are happening. Um, and those changes are real. So this is Miami. This is uh, not where the hurricane is going to strike. Well, probably not. Um, uh, in the next day or two, but this is uh, high end. This is very expensive real estate. Most of these, um, most of these apartments are not occupied. So these are living establishments that are primarily an investment vehicle for Russian oligarchs and South American businessmen and things of that nature, right? Um, so all this is essentially a finance, is essentially a bank account or not all this, but a lot of this is a bank account for folks that have a lot of money. So they've parked it in real estate because American um, real estate is a pretty secure investment deal. This is what we're seeing here, this visualization is an estimate of sea level rise in the next couple decades, right? And so uh, pretty soon, I can't tell you when it's gonna be, is it gonna be next year? Is it gonna be 10 years? At some point, we're going to have enough flooding and these people that own these properties as investments are going to say, screw that. I'm going to move to London. I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to move to somewhere else and pull their money out. Almost all or a large fraction of the economy of this part of Florida comes from taxes, right? From the, the ability of the municipal government to do things, to do sewer and power and everything. So once this happens, this is going to be fantastically quick. This is going to be, this is going to look like something like Hurricane Katrina. As opposed to over a day, it'll probably happen over a few weeks or a month or two. These guys will start selling their apartments and then, and then the price will go down and then everybody else will start to sell and all of a sudden we'll have a massive run on this real estate. And then the folks in South Florida are gonna be really screwed because they're gonna be dealing with sea level rise and have very low tax base to deal with that. So this is part of coastal management. Venice is, is dealing with flooding. Venice has uh, uh, taken the approach of hard engineering. And a lot of times you'll hear people say the response to these co our coastal management problems are to build a bunch of things. It's usually dudes, it's usually engineers, like very macho men, and really want to build something strong, right? We now view this as, as a failure, right? So these things can work, and, and it's important to have that in your toolbox. But as the default run to thing, this will not save us. Hard engineering, concrete walls, boulders will not save us. We need other approaches to managing um, our coastline. There's a lot of special interests in the coastal zone, a lot of political power um, that is going on, and there's a lot of historic um, exclusion and disenfranchisement. So the classic story here is um, the one uh, down in Los Angeles um, at Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach, what we now call Manhattan Beach. And the story there was, this was a, in, 100 years ago, this was a place where um, African American folks that could not go to the regular beach because of racism and exclusion and redlining and all that kind of stuff, 
uh, started, you know, started going to Manhattan Beach when it wasn't Manhattan Beach, when it was just dunes, right? And nobody thought, thought it was not very, a very attractive area. And they started, um, you know, pulling together a little uh, uh, vacation spot. And then they started developing it to sell to other African-American families as, as another home or, you know, vacation spot. And then the city came in through eminent domain and said, no, 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 you can't do that. We need to take this. And they took it from the family, did not give them fair market value, and then turned around and, and didn't use it for you know, a, a, a critical um, a civil need. And so after decades and decades of lobbying, finally, um, and we had to change the state, let, um, we had to pass a law in the state of California and some ordinances in Los Angeles County, essentially, um, this land was given back, this one chunk of land, which is, if you know the area, it's where the lifeguard station is down there, um, and uh, as, as an attempt to redress some of these historic wrongs. So this notion of exclusion and, and powerful people and stuff, that's also part of coastal management. This is an example of the same thing going on in, in Australia. In this case, these are uh, Chinese laborers working uh, um, sugarcane fields with the same, same idea. We need objectivity to talk about these things, and we, we need that throughout the semester um, to deal with hard problems like this, infrastructure problems like this, to deal with emerging problems like this. This is a, a oil spill. Or this is a chemical spill in um, coastal Louisiana. Um, the threats are always, with all of our resource management stuff, they're always um, uh, just around the corner, right? So in this case, this was um, from a few years ago, and this was the effort to, to re- uh, to expand oil and gas drilling um, around the U.S. I would just note that um, uh, Governor DeSantis says he wants to do, it, were, were he to be elected president, wants to massively expand oil and gas drilling all throughout the U.S., except for Florida. Florida's too important, so we can't drill there, but everywhere else we should be drilling, um, as an example of the types of threats that, that never end. Um, and there's also incredible wonder and an awesomeness in the coastal zone. So these, this, is, this looks like we're kind of standing on, on a beach, let's say, and it looks like we're looking into um, like a pool of water. It's not, this is all underwater. So this is, there's, there's water on the top of the screen, there's water on the bottom of the screen, and so this is a brine lake, a, ch a, a layer of salt water, saltier water inside salt water. So crazy stuff exists around the planet. Um, there's cro th that thing that my head's in is a model of a real crocodile, right? Saltwater crocodile, or what sometimes people call estuarine crocodiles. Massive dude. Um, sea turtles, all kinds of cool stuff um, going around. And, uh, and bears in our coastal zone. We had bears foraging in our co coastal zone and all that stuff historically, all that kind of neat stuff. And then um, as a wrap up to this section, I'll just say that, that our culture and, a, and our healthy ecosystems are completely coupled right? And, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And so we derive culture from well-managed resources. Um, so that's a hula dancer on the left. That's my uh, grandma in the middle picture um, many, many years ago um, in Hawaii. Um, and uh, uh, I'll just say that um, families are nurtured, communities are nurtured by having healthy places to recreate, healthy places to forage, and healthy places to, to take shelter from. And that's what we're also working on here in our coastal and marine management class.